Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome back uh, to Sanjeev's lectures. So today we have the third and concluding talk on the theory for representation. So this uh, is about representation learning. Uh, it's a little bit related to the language model that I talked about, the word to work like model um, in the first lecture. So holy grail of ML is, of course, a high level ability to get a high level description of an object, whatever that means, uh, using as little human supervision as possible, which is what we seem to do implicitly uh, in our heads, um, that, uh, yeah, a kid who grew up in the Sahara and only learned somehow, uh, you know, the topography there can still go to a new place and learn some representation of what he's seeing and navigate around there. So if you see this scene here, uh, and show it to a human, the human can quickly parse it and say it as, you know, it's a beach with kids, there's a tree there, coconut tree, uh, there's a kite flying, there's a rubber ducky, etc. And of course, humans can miss out on things like the person who's upside down in the water or something or the stone. So it's, it's a representation, it's high level, it's not complete. There could be multiple high-level representations. You and I may have a different high-level representation, etc. So it's not a uniquely defined object, clearly. And of course, high-level is not uniquely defined because you know you could even just say the pixels in the image is a representation, right? It's a fine representation. So none of these terms are completely well defined. But if you can solve this ill-defined problem, then uh, you hope that this gives a learner ability to flexibly adapt to new tasks, like that kid going from the Sahara to, to Greenland, let's say. And uh, with very little training examples, you know, he sees this thing and people say, oh, that's snow and that's a mountain. And then the kid can navigate, okay? Just a little bit of uh, supervision and then the kid can navigate in that new environment. So that's the uh, holy grail. <coughs> so talk overview today, so warm up. Uh, so I gave a similar talk, but starting from part two, but for a more technical audience. And as a warm up, I wanted to tell you about something else that I thought about a fair bit, word embeddings, uh, which is a very simple representation scheme, okay, uh, and unsupervised learning. And then part two is this, Survey of representation learning and its goals in vision and NLP from a theory perspective. So uh, that's part two, fairly non-technical. And part three is a slightly more technical part, our new paper, which is a new analysis framework, which is minimalistic as you would want theory to be, make minimal assumptions, and yet surprisingly powerful. In part four, I'll talk about some experiments that uh, our group did with, the, with these notions. So the first part, as I said, is about word embeddings. Uh, this paper uh, uh, with at the, my team at the time, uh, Yuan Jili, grad student, Yang Yu Liang, uh, postdoc, Teng Yu Ma, uh, po uh, student at the time, Andreas Teski, student at the time, and all of these are now elsewhere, uh, faculty or whatever. So what is meaning? Uh, and what is understanding, right? Just for words, even. And we talked about uh, this a little bit in the first lecture, the word to work model, but uh, let's slow down a bit and think about this a little bit. What is meaning and how do you test understanding? Like, you understand the meaning of words. How do I test that understanding? So some examples, so you may want to s have the ability to solve analogies. So psychologists actually do that. They're, when they're checking for developmental issues in a child, they see if the child can solve analogies. So man is to woman as king is to. And uh, you, may, you may be asked to give more examples in a sequence of words, similar words. So 
Japan, Tokyo, China, Beijing, German, Berlin. Uh, so give more examples of that. So this, of course, requires knowledge. Uh, so word embedding is a representation of a word's meaning as a vector. And this vector representation of the word meaning, as I said last time, we were using 300-dimensional vectors. It's useful for these and many other tasks, like machine translation, answering questions, etc. The successful example of unsupervised learning. So what does it mean to represent the meaning of a word with a vector? Uh, and uh, how do you solve these tasks? So how can you represent the meaning with a vector? So to, to describe the theory behind this, let me ask you this riddle. Think of a word that co-occurs with cow, drink, babies, and calcium. Milk. So this illustrates a powerful principle that the meaning of a word is pinned down already by what words it co-occurs with. I told you these four words that it co-occurs with, and all of you knew it was milk. So in some sense, knowing if, I, you, know, if you have a word, blah, whatever, x, and I tell you the words that it co-occurs with, and maybe even the frequencies of co-occurrence with the other words, that starts pinning down this word. There's a kind of indirect circular definition of meaning, right? Assuming you know the meaning of the other words, you know the meaning of this word. But that's fine, right? W word meaning is always relative to other words. So that's an uh, example of the, what's called the distributional hypothesis of meaning from uh, philosophy and uh, linguistics, that the meaning of a word is determined by words it co-occurs with. So now, in line with what I already said, the following is a high-dimensional word embedding for word W. So remember, English has, say, 100,000 words. You could use the 10,000 most frequent words if you want, to, if you want a shorter vector. So here's a 100,000-dimensional vector representation for the meaning of a word W. It just gives me the probability that it co-occurs with all these other 100,000 words in a window of size 5 in a corpus. So take an arbitrary large text corpus, Wikipedia or whatever, what have you, and compute these empirical probabilities that the word W co-occurs in a window of size five, window meaning consecutive five words, and that'll be this large vector, 100,000 dimensional vector, would be a representation of the meaning of the word. So you see meaning is now captured by this vector in some sense. So there are better embeddings than this. This is very high dimensional. You can do dimension reduction on this. So you, you can do SVD, that was D.O. Wester et al., a uh, seminal paper uh, where they introduced these ideas. Uh, but you can do other nonlinear dimension reductions like neural nets and energy-based models. So the word 2 vec that we talked about is roughly like this. And it's an energy-based model, yeah, an example of an energy-based model. So questions about word embeddings. So this has been well studied for 20 years, and especially a lot in the last five, six years. Yeah. Uh, I mean, can you give a flavor of how it goes from 100,000 to, let's say, 100 or whatever your word to SVD. Add? Oh, SVD is single value. So, uh, but that's? That's a simple one. OK. Oh, word to back. You want an explanation of word to back. We'll get back to it. Yeah, the nonlinear one. <laughs> yeah, it's not clear from the functional form I described earlier, but yeah, it is actually like that. So one question, why do they exist? You know, why can a 300 dimensional, so low, low dimensional word embeddings, why can a 300 dimensional vector faithfully summarize the distribution of 100,000 context words, giving an efficient realization of Furt's idea? Why do semantic relations correspond to lines? So this was a celebrated discovery in the word to vec paper, that you could solve analogies by this linear algebra kind of thing. So like minus to one king is two. That analogy can be solved by taking the vector for king, the 300-dimensional vector for king, 
man and woman and computing that ve vector on the right-hand side, and then looking among all the English words and picking the vector that's closest to the right-hand vector. Okay, and out of those 100,000 English words, that vector happens to be the vector for queen. So this caused a lot of excitement, and on some simple analogy tasks, it could do, this method could do very well. So this was um, the beginning of my interest in this representation learning area, because this is so striking. Like something so ill-defined as language and meaning and analogies, none of these are mathematically precise things, and then out pops this very mathematically precise thing, this linear relationship or approximate linear relationship. So it really caught my attention. I hope it catches your attention. So this is just meant to get you very excited about the possibilities here, that there's uh, very beautiful stuff going on. Why is there a sp sweet spot for dimension? <coughs> so this was already pointed out empirically 20 years ago. There's a sp sweet spot for dimension. Uh, that quality, if the dimension is too low, the quality is not good enough, and around 300, 1,000 is, is a sweet spot for many tasks. And so in this paper, the Tarkle paper, we gave an explanation via a new generator model for language. So I, I won't have time to describe this old paper from 2016, but I do want to give you a taste. So, so question one, why do low-dimensional word vectors exist? So let me sharpen that question. So if you look at these word to vec like models where there's an exponential and so on, and there's another model called GLOVE, which also has something like that. Uh, those are famous, very famous papers. Um, turns out that the essence of it is, or, or a rough essence of that is, that it's doing an SVD on a very funny matrix. So it's a matrix, you know, where the entries are pairs of words. So rows are words, columns are words, and so the WW prime entry is the following thing. It's called the PMI, point-wise mutual information, which is the log of the ratio of the joint probability of WW prime in the corpus divided by the product of the marginals. Okay, so the joint probability is the probability that these two words occur within a distance five in the corpus. That and then the, the denominator is the product of the marginals. So it's some nonlinear function of the co-occurrences of the words. So you construct this matrix whose each entry is this nonlinear function of co-occurrences, and then you do SVD on it. Rank 300 SVD, singular value decomposition, which is just a rank reduction method if you haven't seen SVD. And somehow that is a sort of sweet spot. So, um, yeah, so what property, so to sharpen my question, what property of language causes this 100,000 by 100,000 matrix to have approximate rank 300? And in general, for empirical settings, this is often the case that matrices, large matrices, actually have low effective rank. And the main issue in developing a theory for this is a nonlinearity in the logarithm. Because uh, if you don't have the, that, then there's a simple explanation going back 20, 25 years, topic models. So I'll quickly describe to you how, I, how we try to explain this. <clears throat> so we came up with a simple generator model for language, uh, which is the following. So it's a dynamic version of a log linear topic model. So the, the, the model is as follows, that the writer of Wikipedia or whatever corpus you're looking at, you know, as they write out this large corpus, they are thinking about all kinds of different topics. And a topic, uh, topics uh, reside in some kind of semantic space, which is d-dimensional. And each direction in d-dimensions is associated with a discourse, which is a narrow topic. And each word, all, w is also associated with, with a vector in this space, which is a latent variable of the model. And the corpus is generated by a random walk of a discourse vector C on a unit sphere in D dimensions. And at any step as this, as this random walk is happening, and it's at this point, 
it emits a few words. And it emits a few words according to this distribution, where the probability of W's output when the walk is at some point CT is proportional to exponential of EW and CT. Okay, so this is just illustrating the random walk on the sphere. Oops, it went off a little bit. And as it does this random walk, it emits a few words. And it just keeps doing that, and that's your corpus. It's a very simplistic model of language emission. But even here, you can ask, what distribution on biograms does this? Biograms is uh, pairs of words. Um, does this process generate? And uh, by the way, this is just an illustration. Uh, yeah, if you know what a random walk is, it's not telling you anything new. Uh, so Ying Yu, my postdoc, uh, fitted a model, and then he generated he inferred the random walk that's being used for that text over there. Okay, so it's just illustrating that. All right. So you can uh, analyze this random walk because you know this topic vector is a random vector moving around in the sphere on the sphere, which is kind of like a Gaussian vector. That's the main idea. So you can think of the CT as a Gaussian vector. And then all of the integrals that you need become much easier. And what I'll tell you the result of all those in integrals. Uh, so the log of the joint probability, the probability that would WW prime occur next to each other, is related to the underlying vectors like that. And the marginal probability is proportional to the square of the norm of the vector. And there's the Z, which is the partition function. It's a constant. Uh, in, the, in the theory, and the norm of the word vector determines frequency, and the spatial orientation, right, which determines its core, which uh, determines its inner product and so on, determines the meaning, right? According to Har uh, the fourth Harris definition of meaning, you know, the meaning of the word is determined by its co-occurrences, and that's determined by its inner product with the other um, uh, word vectors. So you can play with this theory a, a lot more, which we did, which I won't talk about today. And you can explain why you know, there's a sweet spot in the dimensions, you know, which, uh, uh, or wide source uh, analogies, et cetera. So that's a longer talk. And maybe it's on YouTube somewhere, which you can see from a year or two ago. <coughs> so but uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you this tasting of you know amazing things that are going on like capturing meaning and there's mathematics you can do with it and yeah this theory there were various predictions uh some of which were new for the linguists and the computational linguists and uh, which i won't talk about so one one new prediction had to do with polysemy that words have multiple meanings right like bank can be a financial institution or the site of a river or various other things a maneuver that the aircraft does so the word bank has many meanings, and, but there's only one vector. Uh, and uh, how does that vector encode all those meanings? So our theory predicted that the vector, the various meanings reside in linear superposition inside the word vector. It's a very striking thing, which is kind of related to why the analogies thing works. Yeah, so in this theory, uh, a lot of the linear algebra is explained that Oh, by the way, so that's the PMI uh, calculation from the first two terms, which I forgot to do earlier. And that's indeed you know, suggesting that the PMI matrix should have approximate low rank. So I have some articles on embeddings uh, a couple years old. Uh, and I welcome you to look at that. Or there might be some talks on YouTube. <coughs> oh, it doesn't predict 300. It just shows that there's a sweet spot. It's not square root, I think. I'm forgetting, yeah, what the expression is. That is an intriguing thing. I forget if it was that, but I, I don't think it was that. OK, any other questions? Yeah. So co-occurrence matrix is low dimensional, but also this PMI matrix with logs and correct. Has it something to do with the um, the graph that one will obtain if we look at the semantic relationship between words? Yeah, I the don't think the graph there. view is the correct one. I know that's what you know. In my previous life, I would have liked to. Okay. Like, you know, everything is discrete and graphs, and 
I don't think that's the right way to look at this. Yeah. I mean, you can define a graph post hoc, but I don't think. Yeah. So once we see the vector, we can define the graph. But assuming we had that um, uh, true value of semantic relationships of words, now it's very popular to use word to vec and then construct the uh, yeah, I think that's right, yeah. But then assuming we had g of v comma i, the clustering there probably is what gives it's us not 300 dimensions. It's not no. No. Yeah. No. So uh, this was what you're describing is exactly what people were doing in computational linguistics. In the 90s, it was very popular. And I think that clustering approach is inherently not the right way to do this. And this is a much better way to do it. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, yeah. The word to back, yeah. So that uh, I didn't describe. Yeah, but you can sort of see that there is a, at least it looks like the right functional form, right? There's exponentials floating around and so on. Yeah, I didn't describe the word to vec. But yeah, in the paper, we show that the existing methods like word to vec and glove are implied by this random walk. Like there are different estimations for this process, for the underlying uh, variables. So one is, I think, a map estimate, and one is log likelihood, some such thing, yeah. So there are different estimates for this. Uh, where what where you know using the distributional hypothesis and doing a low rank approximation would not work, uh, you know like cases like I don't know uh, qualitative description of things which occur in same contexts but mean different things, uh, like good or bad or even opposites, things which oh yeah there are failures of the yes. distributional hypothesis well known failures going fifty years so does like good and bad. Right. Does this opposites opposites is a big problem for the research. right. So, but does this uh, way of doesn't do anything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it suffers from the same issues as the distribution hypothesis. Okay. Yes. So, is this a perfectly symmetric matrix, or is W W prime different from the order inversed? No, we are assuming they're the same. Yeah. So. Uh, it's symmetric for us. So, if it is symmetric, you I mean, isn't the SVD like the eigenvalues? Oh, yeah, 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 indeed, yeah, yeah. Question. It just where the vector is in space, which determines its inner products with everybody else. Yeah, I don't, I didn't describe that. That's an assumption in the theory, which seems empirically to be correct. I didn't describe it at all. It li literally, as, it's, as the name suggests, it means that the word vectors over, you know, all 100,000 vectors are sort of uniform in space. So I'll move on to what we're doing these days, representation learning, a much more general theory. And from now on, we'll work with minimalistic assumptions because we want it to apply to all kinds of things, not just words. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, so there'll be no explicit generative model for data. You know, I don't know if the same model can possibly describe text and images or anything else. So it's much more general, but turns out it's still very closely related. In the back, I mean, I won't talk about the connection, but turns out it is, if you think about it more. OK, so standard, so I want to go back to this issue of the, that the standard framework for ML that I described in the first two talks, you know, training error, test error, and all that, you know, derived from classical statistics clearly has some limitations uh, when it comes to capturing intelligence and learning that we want to capture. So we assumed that the training and test involve IID samples from the same distribution. We've discussed this before. And that the generalization error that we compute is training loss minus test loss. So in particular, that the test loss is measured in the same way as the training loss. Right? Uh, otherwise, this if they have uh, sort of different uh, uh, if they have a type, mis type mismatch, it, it wouldn't make sense. And, but the whole point is that the goal of learning is to be able to solve new tasks. Test and train would involve very different objectives. Okay, so for example, to use the previous thing we were doing, word embeddings. 
right? Word embeddings were trained using word co-occurrences and so on. Then you use it to solve analogies. It's a completely different task, completely different objective. So this equation makes no sense because you're going to do a task which is completely different. It's like adding rupees and dollars or something, right? Or subtracting. It's a different type mismatch. And uh, so this whole framework doesn't make sense. So I emphasize that practitioners have known this for many, many years. Okay, they, they've developed all kinds of frameworks and ways of thinking about this, but the theory hasn't caught up. And some examples that the practitioners have come up with <coughs> are things like representation learning, transfer learning, meta learning, learning to learn. They're all kinds of buzzwords. Okay, you have TensorFlow, you have neural nets, you can do all of these, you want to at least try to do them, and people are doing it. But where's the theory? And in this talk, we'll talk about transfer learning, sorry, uh, representation learning, uh, but I think there'll be connections ultimately to the other notions as well, as you'll see. So what is representation learning? So representation, it's, as the name suggests, it's coming up with a new representation of data. Like for words, we came up with word vectors. So similar representations for any other data type. So the data point is x. Representation function that you learn is f of x. And let's, we'll discuss how you learn the representation function. But for now, it's just a representation function. So you can convert x into f of x. That's the representation. And how is this rep representation going to be used in our framework? Is that it's going to be used for new classification tasks using these representations. You could, of course, define some other test, like analogy solving or whatever. So it's some new task. The main point is it's new. And in our simple framework today, it's a classification task. Importantly, it's new. Okay, It was not seen the labels and so on were not seen when you learn the representation function. So what's a powerful representation? It takes, it, it, it uh, converts x into a much nicer high level representation, right? Such that new classification tasks like complicated image recognition or something, some such task, can be solved via a linear classifier. Okay, that's our working definition okay you can obviously extend this theory or try to extend it to you know where the linear is something else etc i mean the theory does apply to logistic linear etc so example in traditional machine learning theory is the kernel svm don't know it don't worry about it um, basically the idea is that you lift x to uh, some other representation and uh, and then that rep in that representation, linear classification is possible. All right, but in kernel SVM, you know a priori what the representation function is that you're going to use. But here we want to learn the representation. It turns out that deep nets train on lots of label data implicitly learn a fantastic representation, as you would imagine. So here is a picture of a 19-layer deep net, BGG19. Doesn't matter what all it does along the way. But then on the last layer, it basically has a linear classifier, a logistic classifier, actually. So, and it does, uh, you know, thousand-way classification with thousand examples each, so a million examples total. So now look at that last layer. It's mapping the input to some vector, in this case of size 4,000 dimensions. And on that vector, whatever that vector is, you know, after you map image to that vector, which requires all this deep learning, deep nets in, in, in between, that vector is fantastic representation, right? Because you can do that thousand way classification via linear classifier on that. 
So it's a fantastic representation for these thousand tasks that you trained on. Okay? It's very powerful. Powerful because it allows this very complicated thousand way task. So I apologize, maybe many of you haven't seen ImageNet. Uh, this, I, I should have had some examples, but it's like an image classification task, you know, very fairly complicated. It was, yeah. So that complicated task, it solves via, that representation allows you to solve via a linear classifier. How distinct tasks are. Oh, this is a classic data set, ImageNet. Okay. So, so, so far, I'm just describing to you the supervised deep learning that I described earlier, right? You did a supervised deep learning on ImageNet, which is like a classic data set. And my, the, what I'm pointing out here is that if you look at the last layer, yeah. that is a representation, right. which allows you to solve this very complicated task with a linear classifier. This very complicated task of a thousand way. It's like a famous task. I see. Right. This this ent this entire. I'm rephrasing what deep learning is doing. Okay. It's a 19 layer net, and the first 18 layers are computing a representation of the input, which is high level, and on the, the last layer is a linear classifier on that representation. I'm just rephrasing. It's sort of trivial rephrasing. Does it have any? any non-triviality. And it is, uh, so it is actually something very interesting. So, so firstly, the vector on this layer is a good representation in unrelated tasks. <coughs> so if you now have just not just a thousand, but you add some other new tasks, which the method is never trained on, this representation is still a pretty darn good representation for that task. And you can solve it with a linear classifier. Okay, so even new ta for even new tasks, this representation is pretty good because it's very flexible. It already trained on a thousand image recognition tasks. It has a pretty good idea of the content of images. Um, the second point I want to make is that the performance of this deep learning is going to be abysmal if you had only two classes. Right? But in theory, of course, two-way classification is no harder than thousand-way classification. Right? If, so you would imagine that if you just had a two-way classification, you would do much better. But actually, it helps it to have the other 998 classes to learn the proper representation. If you just had two classes with 1,000 examples each, the performance would be abysmal. Okay, So that's proof that somehow it's learning to abstract what's the content of an image that having the other 998 classes helps it to learn a better representation. So yeah, so uh, uh, the talk I gave a week ago somewhere, people asked that too. And I think the sharp, uh, let me tell you a sharper version of the question. The question was, suppose you had a million examples of the two-way classification. Maybe that's what you mean. Would the performance be better on that? or would it be better with a thousand way class? And actually, I forgot to do that experiment. I'll ask somebody to do that. Uh, but it, the experts seem to think that the thousand way would be better because it learns a better representation. I'm not sure. So let's call such representations gold standard. They are learned with a lot of label data. Can we learn such gold representations with no unlabeled data? Sorry, with no labeled data. <coughs> I think I'm still trying to understand. You're saying that if you uh, train this uh, million uh, cases and partition it into a thousand No, you're classes. given the thousand classes ahead of time. ImageNet has a thousand classes. So it already has labels. Has it has th yeah. So every image has one of these thousand labels. And you then train it, using that. Uh, okay. So so you train it, and so it puts it into one of these thousand bins, uh, and uh, and you're saying then it would be much better than if uh, than if you had put the same data but into two bins. Uh, 
Uh, it would For be example. much uh, better in doing other tasks. Uh, uh, yeah, the point I'm making here is suppose uh, you know you only had two tasks with a thousand examples each. The performance on that would be abysmal. But that's the question I guess yes. he was asking. And, and then one yeah, million if you had you one million of the two, then would it be better? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, but the point is, it's doing that two-way classification with a thousand examples each pretty darn well provided it has these other tasks, which are not related to these two tasks directly. It's just image recognition tasks, so somehow it helps it to learn a better representation. But presumably, it, it won't be so good if you had uh, uh, 10,000 tasks with 100 examples each. If you increase the number of, uh, sorry, 10,000 classes with 100 examples each. If you try to it make would, it too... It would, uh, it would still be do. It'll do pretty well. Most people. It'll do better than. I mean, is there an optimal thing as you, that you are saying? No, there's no optimality. Yeah, it was just a standard test bed. That's all I'm saying. Thousand and hundred thousand or whatever. It's not important. Yeah, for those of you who don't know the full history or don't know it off the top of your head, yeah, Imagineer was this famous challenge, and the Hinton team cracked it, and that's what launched the modern deep learning era. So, so okay, this is the question from now on, okay? Can we learn such gold standard representations with no label data? And maybe for image recognition at this point, it's not so relevant because image recognition is a solved task because we had all this label data, but there are all kinds of other settings where you don't have enough label data. <coughs> so the question you have to now think about is, how can we possibly learn a useful representation from unlabeled data? So unlabeled data is plentiful. And without knowing downstream classification tasks. Excuse me. Uh, so yes. it would be like uh, we have learned languages, uh, a number of languages, and we are trying to use a same model for, let's say, unknown language, new unknown language. Uh, and uh, what you are suggesting that it Not unknown language. So... Yeah, the analogy is more like, let's say you train, even in language, you know, there are many classification tasks, you know, like are these pair of words synonyms? Uh, is this paragraph a joke or not? Does it contain a joke or not? Is it humorous? Is it, what? yeah, so those kinds of classification tasks. So. So you want a representation for language to learn however you like from unlabeled data so that you get these new tasks. Does this thing have a joke or is this paragraph about history? Some classification tasks like that and you can solve it. It's not complicated with translation and so on. I mean, maybe all of those will ultimately be relevant here, you know, transfer learning and so on, but we're not doing that here. So most theory work is on what's called semi-supervised methods. This goes back a couple of decades, where the training uses both labeled and unlabeled data. But more, pop uh, more importantly, it's using labeled data from the downstream classification task. So it's more like you have a lot of unlabeled data, and then in the 100 classification tasks you are interested in, you have a small amount of labeled data. So using the unlabeled data, you need less labeled data. That's the setting. But you know the task ahead of time. And also popular are generative models. I won't talk about these here, but again, for the machine learning people, this would be very familiar. Uh, but there, it, it's important that the training and test objective are the same. Basically, the perplexity of the log of the <coughs> probability given to the data, which we discussed in the context of what to act. And unclear why this objective sh should suffice for representation learning. I mean, it sometimes does, sometimes doesn't. And it's not clear why that's the right way to do representation learning. Now, just to uh, blow your minds, I'll give you some empirical things that work. Okay, and as a theorist, this really blows your mind. Right, so here's one that from the last couple of years. You're going to learn a representation by unsupervised learning. How? You're going to train a convolutional deep net for the following task. 
So input is an image, together with another image, which is its rotation by either 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or 270 degrees. So you have two images. One is a rotation of the other by one of these three angles. And your output has to be of this convolutional deep net, which of the three rotations is applied? 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees. So the convolutional deep net, when it tries to solve this task, learns very good representations, comparable to the gold standard ones. Not quite, but like pretty darn good. What do you think is going on? I mean, it seems like a trivial task to me, right? How do I solve it? I look at the left image and apply a mental rotation by 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, which seems like an easy operation. And then I match it up, right? Which one matches? Pixel level, it should match. Sounds like a trivial task. Why should it force you to learn anything? Like apply rotation on the image, pixel matching. Suggestions? Yeah. In classical uh, image processing, if you know there are uh, some detectors called uh, SIFT, SURF, which is nothing but representation of an image at different angles. And this work is completely reverse of that. Instead of uh, representing image... But my question is, why should this work? It may be connected to many that, things. That's yeah. what we do generally in uh, uh, detection. The, uh, if it is rotation invariant detection we want to do, we would use this kind of feature. So here we are... No, we're learning the features from trying to do this. The features. Yeah. No, batch is something very different. Patch. Correct. Yes. So the main point here is that, yes, the algorithm I have in mind that I'm going to apply mentally a rotation and then do pixel matching cannot be done by a convolutional net. Convolutional net works with patches and it cannot apply the rotation transformation. So it cannot, up, as far as we know, apply <coughs> the trivial algorithm. It has to do something different. It's forced to learn good representations. Really blows my mind. Yes. The net cannot apply the rotation or the. I, I didn't say it's clear. So uh, it feels like one should be able to prove this. Yeah, it doesn't seem so hard to prove good exercise for a good grad student, that a convolutional net cannot apply a rotation, computer rotation. An arbitrary rotation, yeah. But since it's working with so many, I mean, um, w w what's the intuition that, that, that it can't apply a rotation? It's, it's just a... It's working with patches. Uh, but doesn't it have all the it data? Does, it cannot apply... It doesn't even have, you know, a full rotation is an n by n matrix. Yes. Uh, it may not even have that many parameters. I mean, n is like 10,000, the number of pixels in ImageNet images, 100 pixels on each side, so 10,000 uh, 10, pixels. 10,000 by 10,000 is 100 million. The ConNet may not even have that many parameters. So just the counting argument would show you that most rotations cannot be done. Now, that doesn't mean that 90 degree and 270 degrees cannot be. So the counting argument doesn't rule that out. So it, it requires a proof. If some student here wants to take it on, let me know if it works. OK, so all right. Here's uh, another one for text. And that's kind of reminiscent of word to vec so there, there have been many text embeddings, including some that we developed. And this is a state of the art. Um, so S SOTA is state of the art. Um, you're going to do something like word to vec with a big text corpus. And you have a deep net. And the deep net maps a paragraph to a vector. And what's the training objective? You're trying to minimize this function 
let's see what it is. So this is just inner product of embeddings. So x and x plus are adjacent sentences. So you're picking random adjacent sentences. That's x and x plus. And x minus is a random other sentence from the corpus. So now this method is leveraging that distributional principle of meaning that we were talking about. The two adjacent sentences have probably related meanings. So their inner product should be large. That's what this objective is saying. And, and x and x minus, because x minus is a random sentence from the corpus, should be unrelated sentences. So their inner product should be small. That's what this objective is saying. If you minimize this objective, that's what it's forcing you to do. OK, and f is computed by a deep net. And you can use your favorite deep net architecture. So this has state-of-the-art performance, this sentence embedding. You take a piece of text and uh, compute a vector according to this trained deep net. And you can use that representation to solve other tasks. So we are, our theory is going to be about such methods, where you actually have some weak idea of what are similar data points, in this case, sentences. Adjacent sentences are somewhat similar. How? Maybe not. We don't know. And maybe not all adjacent sentences are similar, but on average, they are. And, uh, and random pairs of sentences are, dis are not similar. <laughs> so we call such methods contrastive learning. It's a name we invented. Um, contrastive is supposed to remind the experts of all kinds of related things. So I should say that uh, a few years earlier, people had, done, had already started doing similar things for uh, image representations, where they use video clips. Of course, the amount of video in the world is tremendous. Right? I'll get to your question in a second. And so here again, they were doing, taking video clips. And now they have some idea that uh, clips you know, which occur in the same, sorry, uh, uh, video frames, which are images, that occur in the same video clip are somewhat related. And random pairs of video clips are, or uh, frames of video on YouTube are unrelated. So a very similar kind of method for images. And that also worked pretty well. Yes? How does this learn a sentence that's not in the corpus? Uh, so the sentence just consists of words. So you know, it learns to map any arbitrary sequence of words to a, a vector. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's like, you know, you train deep net on images. It can still map an image which it has never seen to a vector. So, so, yeah. It's clear? This is a key slide. Like, this is contrastive learning that we're going to analyze. OK, so this is going away from the standard theory paradigm of IID samples. That it's saying that you know, you, it's, you're given these pairs of examples where you have some idea that some are similar and the others are not similar, semantically similar. So by the way, just to illustrate <coughs> the embeddings that you learn from these methods, or, or any of these methods, text embedding methods, Capture human notions of sentence similarity. So if I give you these five sentences, these are from a talk I gave at Carnegie Mellon, so that's why it has Carnegie in Pittsburgh. But um, which are the two most similar sentences in this list of five? One and four. How did you know they're similar? There's no common words, not a single common word. Right? You sort of know that you know the meaning of the sentence. You know that forest and jungle are the same thing. Lion and tigers are very similar, et cetera. Right? And hunting, like you have some idea that lions are 
aggressive hunter, so they rule the jungle. Anyway, so, so somehow there's something more going on, right, in understanding similarity of text than just matching words. So indeed, yeah, if you, this is from some other method that we had, the SIF embeddings, but anyway, if you compute similarity scores via inner product of embeddings, indeed you find that one and four have the highest inner product. So notice that, and we've already seen this with word embedding, so this point was already made, that, that the training objective was very different, right? It was this log and similarity and so on. And then somehow it corresponds to what's going on in your head, which the training has no access to. So the test objective, you know, how well does it match human notions of similarity, has never been used in the training. It's some it's in our head, and but somehow it it uh, does well on that test objective. All right, so this new paper <laughs> with uh, Rishi, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean the uh, the last point you made about uh, that it's something in our head, but you did train it on a corpus which reflects something in our right. head. Yes. If you had trained it on the annals of mathematics, you probably wouldn't have... Uh, Maybe for a subset of people here, it might be similar sentences. Yeah, but uh, it wouldn't have helped in, uh, in, right. uh, in these five. So, right. uh, so that's what the theory is going to grapple with, right? Yeah. That's, uh, that it's not... Yeah, there's some connection to the task that you are interested in. Otherwise, obviously, learning cannot work. From learning, from studying Wikipedia, you wouldn't be able to do some hyper complicated task in microbiology or something. Yeah, so the uh, rest of the talk is based on this new paper, joint work with Rishi Kande Parker. He's an undergrad at Princeton. Even undergrads these days are very amazing. Uh, Misha Kodak, uh, Orestes Clavrakis, and Nikun Sonshi, who are all grad students. And contrastive learning, as I already emphasized, is learning representations by leveraging contrast between similar and dissimilar pairs of data points. So here's the framework So to address Rajesh's question. <coughs> so the data we are training on is not completely unrelated to the task. It's just not explicitly related. So the implicit relationship is as follows. We, we assume that the word has a collection of classes, classes of objects. And an object can lie in multiple classes. Uh, and um, so there's, that's means of transportation, animals, etc. So there are different classes. But of course, an animal can depend, belong to different classes, like wild animals, pet animals, uh, etc. But uh, meat eating animals. So they're different classes, and they can overlap arbitrarily. Now, each class defines a distribution d sub c on data points. So d sub c is the probability of data point x is in c. So what does this probability mean? If you ask people, you know, what's the chance that this object is in c, ask them to give a number between 0 and 1, and that's the number they would give. So for example, the, f uh, yeah, the beach scene photograph could be about lots of things, you know, and it could belong in different classes with different fractional probability. Um, so when training is given similar pairs of data points, contrastive learning is given similar pairs, we assume that nature is picking some C, some class C, according to this measure rho, and then two independent samples, X and X prime, according to DC. In negative samples, you pick, uh, you pick C according to, from some class, and then pick a random sample. So it hmm, should be C and C prime, just two random classes. Typo. So there's, uh, you pick two random classes, C and C prime, and then pick X and X prime from it. So that's the the framework for what <coughs> contrastive data you're given. And now what downstream classification tasks of interest? 
for now we restrict to two-way classification, but the theory extends to multi-way classification. And you pick a random pair of distinct classes. Uh, so assuming you know nature, which will give us this classification task later on after we learn the representation, learn picks a random pair of distinct classes. You may never have seen these classes during training. And you and then nature picks k i d samples from the distribution of the first class and k from k two from the second one. And then the representations are tested on this binary classification task. So that's the downstream classification task. And evaluation representation, nature picks this binary class as above. And then you have to solve it by training a logistic classifier on the representations that you've learned. And logistic is just for simplicity. You can have any um, other classifier. So the logistic classifier is defined as follows. You find the best w such that uh, you know one for C and one for C prime, and such that you minimize this loss. I'll just draw a picture here. Yeah, this is logistic classifier and a binary classifier. You find for the two classes a vector w1 and w2, one for each class, and then now you classify uh, the data point x as being in the class one with that probability and being class two with this, this probability. So logistic classification is used in settings where you allow the classifier to have a non-binary output. Okay, and that makes training a lot easier, okay, differentiable and so on. Any questions about logistic? So I'm just using logistic for illustration. It applies to some other methods, many other methods to the usual methods, but I won't describe that. Okay, and, the, and then the training objective for representation learning with the logs and exponentials is for logistic classifier. If you have some other classifier, linear classifier with other loss, inch loss or something, you know, people use many things, then you would have to change the training objective as well. Okay, so the representation is learned with some objective and that objective depends on how you're going to evaluate the representations later on, you know, using logistic loss, inch loss, whatever. So that's the represent, uh, uh, Unsupervised loss, it's like the loss we saw for text embeddings. And then, of course, is um, empirical objective using M samples. So the first one is over the full distribution of all samples, and this is <coughs> the empirical objective with M samples. Now, unlabeled data is cheap, so assume M is large enough that the above two optima are approximately the same once we fix a class of apps. So for example, ResNet 50 or BGG19, whatever, some class of deep nets. And this exact M is computable using Radamaha complexity. Any questions about the framework? This slide and the last slide. Okay, so we, we're analyzing, in a nutshell, the kinds of learning algorithms people are using. And to analyze that, we are providing a framework for thinking about what are similar and dissimilar pairs of examples, and, uh, and then relating it to performance on classification. So the main question is, how well does this best F out of this unsupervised learning do in classification tasks? And the dream result for analysis would be that it compares with the gold standard. So the gold standard would be the best representation function in the same class of circuits. And an easy observation, you know, once you set up a theoretical framework like this, it's impossible for arbitrary functions, arbitrary trials. This is easy. I mean, in general, uh, these hardness results are easy. So instead, what we should, I guess I'm out of time, huh? Um, what we can show something is that if the unsupervised loss is small, so if you can fit this representation so that the unsupervised loss is small, right? The adjacent sentences are very similar. Random pairs of sentences are far apart. If that loss is small, then the average loss in classification task is low. So that's the kind of result you can show. And I won't go into the proof, but the key step is the Jensen inequality. That, you know, if you take the representations and then within each class take the average vector of the uh, average of the representation vectors, 
that can be used as a logistic as the W1 W2 in a logistic classifier, and that already <coughs> can be bounded via Jensen's inequality using the unsupervised loss. So that's the idea. So this is primarily for the few experts in the audience who've done these kinds of manipulations often and can sort of see how this works. So the supervised loss is related to the unsupervised loss. So that's a very simple case. The more general case so is when this unsupervised loss is not low. So often in many practices, in many practical situations, unsupervised loss is low, but when it's not low, something else happens in practice, and the theory accounts for that. So what, that, what happens is that the representations are fairly concentrated, very clusterable. Oops. Okay. So, uh, so in that case, there's some extension to the bound, and um, I won't have time to do this, but yeah. Basically, it uh, corresponds to the clusterability of the representations within classes. So yeah, you get some version of the dream result that you can compute, compete with gold standard representations so long as the gold standard representations are concentrated within the class. Okay, and there are many extensions to the space thing I talked about, to all loss functions, all K classifications, uh, and a new unsupervised objective that was not known that came out of our theory based upon blocks of R similar data points. So like, not just adjacent sentences, but like take all sentences in a paragraph. They're all probably similar to each other. And then you can write a tighter uh, analysis, a tighter cost function, which does better, as we'll see. So some quick experiments, and then I'll stop. So this was an experiment that we did. Uh, so we didn't really have a text, a very nice data set, so we created one. So this data set has 329 classes, which correspond to articles on Wikipedia. And then w the data points within a class are 200 sentences. So these articles are 200 sentences each, at least. And so 200 sentences randomly picked out of the article. And now uh, we have presented unsupervised data in the form of you know, random pairs of sentences from the same article, and random pair from the corpus, from the full collection. And we train our sentence representations. And now we want to <coughs> compare, compare with the gold standard. So the gold standard would be trained, a deep net train on this 329 way classification task, fully supervised, all the labels. And we find that basically our unsupervised method tracks the supervised method. So this is more an illustration of the theory, where the data is actually following the theory. And then it actually completely tracks. Um, basically, I won't go into the meaning of all these, but uh, I want to emphasize that this, the mu5, is where you're only given five labeled examples per class. And even there, our unsupervised method does very well. So in the if you want to do a classification task later, you can work with just five labeled examples per class because you've learned a good representation. Similar experiments for CIFAR, although the supervised, un this is a more standard data set in vision. Uh, the supervised unsupervised gap is somewhat larger. So for instance, here versus here. And yeah, if you use a new objective for improving the state of the art uh, text embeddings, then actually we, uh, we do well on some existing data sets like IMDB. Okay, so I'll, uh, um, I'll wrap up here. So I've shown you this first cut theory for formalization of representation learning with minimalistic assumptions. And with minimalistic assumptions, you hope that it would uh, apply to more things. Future work, extensions to more intricate settings, such as uh, right now we're assuming classes are completely arbitrary, but maybe they have some lattice structure or tree structure, uh, classes or subclasses, et cetera. So extensions of that more empirical and theoretical developments, uh, like transfer learning, meta learning, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Yeah, stop there. Thanks, Sanjeev. Uh, questions? Uh, so uh, in this setting, uh, where you trained with the unsupervised objective and then uh, tested on downstream tasks. Presumably, if there was some extra capacity for the network for the downstream task, 
uh, it might have done better with the unsupervised embedding itself, right? Like if there was some... It does, yeah, like in CIFAR you see that, right? Yeah. Okay, so there is some extra capacity for the downstream task itself. It's not just uh, classifier slapped on top. Oh, no, no, no. We don't do any training on the downstream task. We don't... It's like... Okay. Just use that final output. But I mean, is the... I mean, from a practical point you of do, view... You, it, would, it would improve, yes. Yeah, but is there a way to incorporate that extra capacity in the pound? In the theory, in the no. Theory? Okay. Because you are going to retrain the deep net. Probably. And then... Probably you would okay. keep the unsupervised representation fixed and just retrain the extra capacity uh, rather than everything. No, that's accounted for in the theory, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, uh, positive pair is pair from the same class? Yes. Yeah, so you're just given these two are from the same class. This is just check of the theory. Yeah. In practice, if you want to apply it in the wild, you would need to have some weak indication like the rotation one, this. Yeah. I think the rotation one, this theory wouldn't explain because the rotation one, I think, really uses the fact that a con net, convolutional net, cannot compute a rotation, which this theory doesn't allow. I mean, doesn't look at. I mean, for it, you know, the deep net is a black box, it can do anything. And so you wouldn't capture that here. No. Yes. Yeah. Can these results be used to improve supervised learning? For example, by combining <coughs> labeled data with unlabeled data, or even by using um, these two sets of loss functions on labeled yeah. data? Yeah, yeah. So if you look at our examples where you're given five labeled examples, yeah, you could try that. Yeah. And it should do at least as well as our unsupervised methods. So semi that's semi supervised. Yeah, it should do better. Yeah, actually, we don't have the numbers, but. Uh, hello. Uh, I might have missed, but uh, the result that if unsupervised loss is low implies that, uh, you know, the loss on the classification will yeah. also go low. What are the assumptions? Are there any assumptions? No assumptions. No yeah. assumptions. Yeah. Okay. Just what I wrote there. So I haven't missed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. It's just a nice calculation using Jensen's inequality. It's it's a very baby result in the paper. There are other in, in the that paper. Uh, it's in this paper. Yeah, it's on. Uh, it's not an archive yet. Uh, hopefully, very soon. Yeah, the students wanted to put in more and more things. So, hopefully, within a couple of days, it'll be an archive. So this result is there in your paper. I just want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the entire last. 40 minutes was, is, in, is from that paper. Yeah. It's from that the new paper, which is not on archive yet, but soon will be. Okay. Yeah, oh. Not in the, in the last 40 minutes, no. It's deep net, yeah. We don't know what it's doing. Is there a role for? Oh, uh, you know, people here are uh, using gradient descent to compute SVDs. Yeah, uh, you know, if you have a matrix that's what were large enough, right? Uh, like the word embedding uh, matrix would be hundred thousand by hundred thousand, so that's ten to the ten size, no. traditional linear algebra breaks. So you just do gradient descent. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the the theory, 
is analyzing supervisors follows. It assumes, as I mentioned, that the supervised, the, the, the best classifier is something like uh, the average representation within a class. You take the representations of all the points in the class, in the, in the downstream task, and take the average. So that mean is the sort of class, of the, the W1 for that class. So we are just bounding the performance of that mean classifier. The best classifier may do better than that. Questions? So uh, the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Yeah. So what is the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning? We're here in this experiment yeah, or yeah. in general? In this experiment. Uh, so this is trying to illustrate the theory, right? like verify the theory. So here you're give, there are, <coughs> we're assuming that nature is ex behaving exactly like our theory, that when you give semantically similar player, pairs, they are from a random pair, a class, two points from a random class. And when you're given dissimilar pairs, they're just two random pairs. And then you're training an unsupervised objective, you know, which I mentioned earlier. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. The point what you're saying. OK, of point of the experiment, or do you want me to say? In general. In general. So we're talking about contrastive learning. Contrastive learning, which is learning a representation from pairs of similar examples. So there was some objective, which doesn't matter, but with this logs and exponentials. So there was that objective. That learned some representations. Now we want to understand, if I just use these representations of data points, and now you give me new classification tasks, how well do these representations do? if I want to solve a new task using linear classifiers. That's what we are studying. And, and this experiment is verifying our theory for that. Is there, uh, is there some way to quantify how versatile a representation is? That's this, right? Yeah, you... No, qu uh, I meant... Uh, 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 and, and not in a particular task. What I meant is a, a general measure for how versatile it can be, meaning some space of tasks that it can carry out. Uh, that you could think of some representations also able to do unrelated tasks, but a smaller number of unrelated tasks but other representations perhaps able to do a wide variety of uh, tasks. Yeah, so we'd like uh, people to think about such theories, right? Like what are distributions on tasks and so on. So right now we're making minimalistic assumptions. There's some, nature has some distribution on tasks, like on classes and tasks. And that's the universe of tasks, right? And then we are actually giving you, answering exactly those questions. So now you are saying, Oh, no, that's not my universal task. There's even more tasks, and then we don't know. But this is what this is trying to do, right? It's defining a measure on the universe of all tasks. Uh, so I didn't get how it defined the measure on the tasks. Uh, so this was the definition of semantically similar pairs, that there's some Nature has some classes and distribution of points in the classes, etc. And these are arbitrary classes. Could be a continuum. Hmm. There's just a measure on them. But, uh, but then what you had... And now have... we say nature is going to pick classification tasks, two-way classification tasks. The theory extends to K-way. How does it pick a two-way classification task? It picks them according to that measure, product measure, and then gives you IID samples. But then uh, what you had later uh, when you were showing those uh, overlap uh, that uh, you had this log function, which... This is just for the analysis. This is, this is the framework okay. to answer your question. Yeah, but... What we do with it is the, uh, something else, but this is the framework. This is exactly what you're asking for. 
But yeah, as I said, this one could now consider more complicated settings where the classes are not just arbitrary with the measure, but there's some structure in there or whatever. Yes. So, uh, just a general question about the idea of you know mapping sentences into these uh, high order representations. So, uh, of course, you know there are these sentences which are grammatically correct but make no sense, like this one of you know colorless green ideas think yeah. furiously. Yeah. So, just experimentally, when you do these representations, do these representations map such sentences to some thing which is which has very low inner product with sentences that are meaningful? I mean, is there some sense in which you can differentiate these meaningless sentences from Meaningful sentences, or um, so the more complicated language models would be able to do that. Yeah, more complicated language models. Uh, would presumably, actually, I'm not sure if they. Yeah, I, I don't. I think they, I don't think they can deal with nonsense in the sense that they would treat it as you know some object, colorless green ideas which are swimming. So it would think it's sort of related to you going swimming in your swimming pool, right? That sentence, and so on. I, I think they will see some similarity there, even though this sentence is meaningless. Uh, probably. So, but there are some more advanced methods using language modeling, which, would, which might see that that sentence has low probability, the nonsense sentence. That it's, goes back to the debate between Chomsky and, yeah, that, you know, it's not a meaningless sentence. It is a meaningful sentence used by Chomsky to illustrate the fallacies of this theory, and therefore it's not a zero probability sentence. So, yeah. Um, just, um, I mean, just to make sure I understand this. So, in uh, you also had this in the in the unsupervised setting, you had this notion of things which are similar and which are not, right? So, would you say it's weakly supervised setting in some sense? You can think of it as weakly supervised. Okay. Yes. We call it contrastive learning. That's the name. Okay. Uh, if there are no other questions, I would firstly like to thank Sanjeev for a very hectic agreeing to a very hectic schedule of intense. Uh, th uh, three lectures over two days, uh, and uh, secondly, for giving this sort of a very nice overview of the uh, uh, of the theory behind machine learning. So thanks very much. Uh, thank you.